Even before the end of World War II, the U.S. military was considering how it needed to reorganize once the war was over. So a month before D-Day, the Joint Chiefs of Staff appointed a special committee for the reorganization of national defense. This committee was comprised of flag and general officers from the Navy, Army, and Army Air Force. And 11 months later, they made their recommendations. The National Security Act of 1947 established the National Security Council, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the U.S. Air Force as a third branch of service. So now there were three branches of the military, Army, Navy, and Air Force, under what was called the National Military Establishment, also known as the Department of Defense, with a single civilian in charge. Immediately, this caused concern from the highest levels of U.S. Navy leadership, particularly Leahy, King, and Nimitz. They were concerned because the Secretary of Defense now had too much power. Also, unlike what had been the case when you had a War Department and a Navy Department, now with the Department of Defense, the budget was a zero-sum game. The other concern that particularly Nimitz had, and he was CNO at this time, was that the existence of a U.S. Air Force would diminish and perhaps jeopardize the existence of U.S. Naval Aviation. So in the wake of the atom bomb being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, bringing a swift end to the war in the Pacific, and with the threat after World War II immediately pivoting to stopping the spread of communism and the Soviet Union as a nuclear power, the most important war fighting capability was that of nuclear weapons. And this brand new U.S. Air Force posited that the way to wage nuclear war was through this new airplane that they wanted called the B-36 had a range of 5,000 miles, could launch out of the United States and attack targets anywhere in the world. So in the face of this assertion by this brand new rival service, the U.S. Navy started to develop its own approach to nuclear war. A top secret point paper was authored by Rear Admiral Daniel Gallery, a pilot who had made his name during the Battle of the Atlantic fighting German U-boats. He noted that any target in the world was within 1,500 nautical miles of the sea and a carrier could be deployed quickly in that crisis, did not require the establishment of expensive overseas bases. The aircraft carrier that could carry out this mission was given the designation Project 6A. The Douglas A3D Sky Warrior was going to be the principal airplane that delivered nuclear bombs. So it needed a bigger flight deck than the latest, which was the Midway class. So this aircraft carrier, which they called a supercarrier, needed a flight deck that was 1,125 feet long, 132 feet wide, with a full load displacement of 80,000 long tons. The plan that they forwarded was the Navy would build four of these supercarriers that would operate in what they called carrier strike groups with a Midway class and two Essex class aircraft carriers. So the plan was to build four of these supercarriers between 1949 and 1952, with all operational by 1955. The first supercarrier, Project 6A, was scheduled to cost $189 million, which translated into 2021 dollars is about $1.7 billion. So that's pretty cheap, considering that a Ford class carrier costs somewhere between 11 and $13 billion today. At the time, the defense budget was only $14 billion, which translates to about 125 billion dollars in today's dollars. Remember that the last defense budget was about 725 billion dollars, but because one ship was accounting for a large percentage of the total defense budget, this was going to attract the attention of what was known as the Bureau of the Budget. So in late 1947, the Bureau of the Budget's director, a guy ironically named Jim Webb, states that he's opposed to this supercarrier not to mention four supercarriers, because of the cost. So then the Secretary of the Navy, John Sullivan, says he will give up a battleship Kentucky and what was known as a battle cruiser Hawaii to fund Project 6A, the supercarrier. And so Webb says, okay, based on that horse trading. Also, it should be noted that the Air Force at the same time was giving up on other airplane projects to fund the number of B-36s it wanted. And again, all this is happening because of the sense that any war fought against the Soviet Union, our principal threat, was going to be a nuclear war or at least have a nuclear component to it. 
Because this Unification Act had not been fully made into law, the Navy went ahead and started to build the first Project 6A supercarrier, which they called the USS United States. So now it's the spring of 1948. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal convenes a gathering in Key West to work out some of the details of this new thing called the Department of Defense, including who's going to have the lead with respect to nuclear war. And much to the Navy's displeasure at this get-together, Forrestal gives the Air Force the lead in nuclear war with the Navy relegated to a secondary mission. So that move doesn't help the Navy's paranoia with respect to its future and the future of naval aviation. Towards the end of 1948, the Navy is so concerned with its status that CNO Lewis Denfeld creates Op 23, which is a research and policy unit headed by distinguished World War II combat veteran Captain Arlie Burke. Now, the unspoken mission of Op 23 is to dig up dirt on the U.S. Air Force and specifically on the B-36 program. So they start to do that. Now, events in the spring of the following year, 1949, take Op 23's efforts to the next level. First, the Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, who had supported the construction of the USS United States, was fired when President Truman discovered that Forrestal had actually worked with his opponent in the presidential campaign, Dewey, with the promise that if Dewey won, Forrestal would stay on as Secretary of Defense. Truman was not impressed by that. So Forrestal was replaced by Lewis Johnson as Secretary of Defense, whose main qualifications were he was a major contributor to the Truman campaign. And then on April 23rd, 1949, things really got ugly when the new Secretary of Defense, Johnson, canceled the construction of the USS United States exactly five days after the formal keel laying. At that point, the Secretary of the Navy, John L. Sullivan, resigned in protest because he was not consulted before this action was taken. And he was replaced by a guy named Francis Matthews, whose main qualification was he agreed with Johnson on the cancellation of the USS United States. So now Navy officials are already concerned about the trend that has happened over the last couple of years since the establishment of the U.S. Air Force are seriously freaked out. And Op 23 takes their propaganda campaign to the next level. Then on May 22nd of 1949, former Secretary of Defense Forrestal, who had been undergoing psychiatric treatment at Bethesda Naval Hospital, committed suicide by jumping out of a 13th story window at the hospital. So some of the Op 23 staff working for Arlie Burke started to socialize what was known as the anonymous document, which asserted that both Secretary Johnson and Secretary of the Air Force Symington had conflicts of interest associated with the manufacture of the B-36, in that Johnson had served on the board of Convair and that Symington was profiting from the B-36 sale. This anonymous document also discredited the Air Force strategy of nuclear warfare, saying that it was inhumane and also over-leveraged against a single warfare capability, and that the B-36 could not perform according to specs, that it couldn't do 5,000-mile range, and it was highly unreliable. So the anonymous document found traction with a Pennsylvania congressman named James Van Zant, who happened to be a reservist in the U.S. Navy, and he called for hearings based on the allegations in this document. His concerns were joined by that of powerful Navy supporter, Congressman Carl Vinson. So in early August of 1949, the congressional hearings under the innocuous heading of unification and strategy were held. So early in these hearings, it came out that Congressman Van Zant's unimpeachable evidence, this anonymous memo, was actually authored by one of the employees in Op 23, a guy named Cedric Worth, whose previous job, ironically, was that of a Hollywood screenwriter. So Worth was assigned to Op 23 from his job as an assistant to the Undersecretary of the Navy, and his involvement was uncovered by an FBI investigation that was started by the Air Force, where they found that his typewriter was the one used to create the anonymous memo. So he was called to testify and right away he admitted that he had created this anonymous document. Additionally, the FBI investigation and a subsequent Navy inquiry uncovered that 
Commander Thomas M. Davies, noted for setting an aviation distance record in 1946, had helped Worth write that paper, drawing on what was described as rank gossip that he had heard. During the Navy inquiry, Davies claimed he had no idea what Worth intended to do with that paper or that it was being circulated all over Capitol Hill. So going into these hearings, the Secretary of the Navy, Matthews, asked naval officers, both active duty and retired, not to go in there and badmouth the Air Force. But because Matthews had little to no respect with the admirals, they didn't follow his request. Particularly Admiral Arthur Radford, who was a distinguished naval aviator from World War II and now was the commander of the Pacific Fleet, called the B-36 a, quote, billion dollar blunder and a symbol of an atomic blitz and what the Air Force was using as a cheap and easy victory through mass destruction of populations. Radford was followed by a parade of admirals, active duty and retired, who took the stands to testify about their concerns with respect to the Air Force's motivation and the viability of the B-36 program, as well as the motives of those who canceled the construction of the USS United States. But the main headlines were grabbed by Captain John G. Cromlin Jr., who was a naval aviator serving on the Joint Staff. So this captain, who was known as Bomber John from World War II, heroic aviator, called a press conference outside the Pentagon to say the Navy was being systematically and intentionally destroyed. He also went on to praise Cedric Worth for what he said were the highest motives of patriotism and selflessness. He was joined by the legendary retired Admiral Bull Halsey, who said that Cromlin deserves the help and respect of all naval officers. Now, although the anonymous document was revealed as being a creation of Op 23 early on in these hearings, Congressman Vincent felt the underlying issues were valid enough to continue a second series of hearings, which took place in October of 1949. So at those hearings, CNO Denfeld, who through the summer had left it to others to carry the propaganda campaign, took the stand to say, quote, there's a steady campaign to relegate the Navy to a convoy and anti-submarine service. He also said, quote, I do not believe that high-level strategic bombing will attain for us the objectives of a war. So as these hearings are going on, the National Security Act of 1947 was made into law. And as well as establishing the National Security Council, the CIA, and the Air Force, it created a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, something that hadn't existed before. And that first chairman was General Omar Bradley, the legendary World War II hero. So now that Bradley is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he unloads on the Navy, calling these admirals fancy dance who won't hit the line unless they could call the signals. He's quoted as saying, I believe that the public hearing of the grievances of a few officers who will not accept the decisions of the authorities established by law have done infinite harm to our national defense, our position of leadership in world affairs, the position of our national policy, and the confidence of the people in their government, end quote. So that statement more or less ended the revolt of the admirals. Truman relieved Denfeld as CNO, replaced him with Admiral Forrest Sherman, for whom the airfield at NAS Pensacola is named, and Op 23 was disbanded. Now, the epilogue to all of this, Congressman Van Zant was re-elected and served until 1963. He also retired as a rear admiral in the Navy Reserve. Cedric Worth resigned and went back to writing movie scripts. In 1957, he produced a documentary called Naked Africa. Captain Cromwell continued to criticize defense officials publicly, received a reprimand, and took early retirement when he was placed on indefinite furlough. He went home to Alabama where he ran for the U.S. Senate and lost. By all accounts, his political views were pretty extreme. In spite of his criticism and his visibility in the first series of hearings, Admiral Radford followed Bradley as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Arlie Burke, who actually was redlined from promotion in December of 1949, was miraculously reinstated in advance to Rear Admiral by President Truman. With Radford as his sponsor, Burke became the Chief of Naval Operations in 1955. The co-author of the anonymous document, Tom Davies, became a Rear Admiral and retired after 40 years in the Navy. The B-36 was fielded in significant numbers and continued in service with the Strategic Air Command until 1958. The Navy did go on to build a supercarrier. It was CVA-59, named the USS Forrestal. Of course, as we all know, the aircraft carrier's value in the years that followed the revolt of the admirals 
was not in nuclear warfare, but in conventional warfare. And the Navy share of the nuclear mission was assumed by boomers, ballistic missile submarines, which took their place in the strategic triad, along with Air Force bombers and ICBMs. And as far as how history has treated the principles in the Admiral's Revolt, Bradford and Burke and even Cromelin have all had ships named in their honor. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber. Give me the likes and comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon with a dollar sign, or become a patron at patreon.com. Check the links below for merch and where to get my first three novels, known as the Punks Trilogy, just re-released by the Naval Institute Press. Use the discount code PUNKYT when you order at usni.org for 25% off. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank <laughs> you.